Welcome to the Ruth Patrick Science Education Center. My name is John Hutchins. I am officially the director of special programs here at the Science Center, and under that is um, the coordinator, uh, co-coordinator of the South Carolina Regional Future City Competition. So that's what we're here today to celebrate and get you all up to speed on. And I'll let Taylor introduce herself. And I'm Taylor Rice. Um, I work with John, of course, on the South Carolina Regional Future City Competition. And I also work in education outreach so we are your contact people for this. You've been in contact mostly with um, Taylor up until this point, but we're both available. You'll have our, both of our contact information. And hopefully by the end of this, um, everybody that's new will have kind of a base knowledge of what to do. And then our veteran folks who are not too many people in here, just a couple today, you'll have um, a better idea of what's going on for this particular year. So just kind of a poll, how many people are brand new Never, never, ever, 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 okay? Done it one year, more than one year, 10 years, <laughs> 15 <laughs> years. <laughs> so we got our, our two experts in here that have done it quite a while. All right, so we are so happy that you guys are with us today. Um, so we did a little survey asking our veteran teachers if if we wanted to break this workshop into veterans and newbies, and they said no, they like the newbies, so you're gonna learn everything over again. So what is Future City? It is a national project-based learning program for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students where they imagine, research, design, and build cities of the future. It is sponsored um, overall through Discovery, which is Discover Engineering, National Engineers Week Society. So the purpose of it is to introduce engineering to students, and they do that through this real-world application uh, project with the students. So um, the goal is to introduce engineering to middle school students through that sustainable, sustainability, authentic question and project. The product, um, the students and you, and hopefully your mentor, will spend these next four to five months researching, creating cities that could exist at least 100 years in the future. Not 99, 100 years <laughs> or beyond in the future. Team-based, it is for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students. This can be um, school-based, this program can be club-based, so like Boys and Girls Club, um, 4-H, those types of recognized, nationally recognized clubs can participate in the program as well. So it involves those students, it involves an educator, and it involves a volunteer mentor. So this next video is, uh, I'll show you this, and you'll have access to all of this stuff that we have, um, the PowerPoint and everything with these links, and you also have a copy in your hand, your um, folder that we gave you, so if you wanna take notes on anything. But all this will be available to you after the workshop as well. I say that because this is also a, this little video here, is a good video if you want to try to get your students enticed to participate in the program. It kind of gives an overall, overarching idea of what Future City is all about. Future City is inspiring. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. I got way more confident. It was really exciting. It was very intriguing. It's a good opportunity. It's like the funnest project ever. Future City is amazing. Are you a middle school student? then Future City is for you. It's a competition that challenges your ingenuity as you imagine, design, and build a city of the future. Team up with your classmates and discover what engineers do. Identify problems, brainstorm ideas, develop solutions, and create a better tomorrow. Oh, it's exciting. When the light bulb turns on for the kids, it's just, it's great because you can see that, oh, wow, that's cool, I got it. For them to be able to think in the future of what might happen and let their imaginations run wild is just as important as them learning that technology that we currently have so that they can take that history and grow from it and build on it. I think the coolest part was building the model. We needed to make buildings that were energy efficient. We also wanted to incorporate some kind of culture. You learn life skills. You learn how to work together in a team. You learn how to plan stuff out. There's also a lot of creativity that goes into it. The essay helps you learn how to write. For me, as a junior high teacher, Future City is one of the most intense, high-level thinking, rewarding projects that I've ever used with my students. 
team competes in a regional future city contest, and the winner goes to the finals in Washington, D.C. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of countless hours working with your team, researching, building, but once you get to that competition and you start presenting and stuff, it's just so much fun. We had to like plan everything out, and we had like deadlines, like this is when we're going to get this part of the essay done, this is when we're going to get this part of the computer city done. It's pretty much like the engineering process though, because you had to brainstorm, then you had to like kind of make a prototype, and then test it out, see what you have to fix. It's just so cool to, just to be here and have such a fun experience where you started off, you didn't know anything about engineering, and now you're at the national competition and you just get to see things that you never imagined. Well, we learned about carbon footprint, we also learned about robotic drones, hyperspectral imaging, self-healing nanomaterial, visual recognition software, gyro technology. Every time that I've been here to judge, I find the students able to articulate scientific and engineering principles well beyond what I would expect of a middle schooler. And, and oftentimes, I think they know this better than I do, and it's very impressive. I just feel that we accomplished something really cool and amazing. All the time and effort that we put into this project, they were definitely worth it. The learning experience, the life experience, even though I'm only in seventh grade, it just makes me feel accomplished. So the outcomes that we hope the program provides is that students can apply math and science concepts better, develop their writing and public speaking skills, become better problem solvers. Teamwork is a huge part of the competition, um, introducing them to different types of engineering. And then also important is learning how their communities work. You know, we live in communities, we live in cities, but kids really don't really know how those th things function. We just think we, we you know, how, how, to, how do you get a traffic light put in your city? Why are roads put in certain places? Why do we put industrial um, factories in one area and commercial places in another and residential in another? So hopefully we'll allow them to become better citizens as well. So the resources that you'll be provided by um, participating in the program. You have your handbook that you have today. This is also online to be downloaded in a PDF format. So um, we can also have, if you need extras for a mentor or someone else that's working with your program, we can get you printed copies as well. Lots of online videos, these regional trainings like we're doing today. The national organization puts out some very good webinars. They've already had one, which was um, for new teachers. We'll provide you that link. I encourage you to go back and watch that. It's really good. At, um, I watched it the other day and it has two veteran teachers in there and they do their program very differently at their school. So you can kind of get ideas on um, what they do and some, you know, just how to's and how not to's. Um, SimCity software is part of the program. We'll talk about how you get that program um, on your computers and then we also have our SimCity committee member who will be here a little bit later to kind of guide our newbies through SimCity if you want. Um, assessment rubric, so every part of the competition is um, assessed <coughs> through a rubric. Those are provided for you, so you kind of really can judge yourself before you turn things in. And then there's a judging manual that all of our judges receive, but then you also have access to that, so you can see the judge, like sample questions that the judges might ask. Normally the cost of the program is $25 per organization. Um, but we do not charge that $25. So if you've registered already, you probably clicked um, whatever the option was that where you don't pay. If you did click the $25, hopefully you didn't pay that already. If you did, talk to us and we'll get that worked out. How many people have already registered through the Future City website? Okay. So if you've not and you are wanting to do the program, we'll need to get you registered <coughs> going forward. Uh, again, 6th to 8th grade. The official team consists of, uh, excuse me, the official competition team consists of five people. Three students, they have to be from the same school or club, one teacher, and one engineering mentor. That is your competition team. That doesn't mean that's the only people that can participate in the program at your school. You can have 105 if you want to working at your school. But once you get a team developed and that team comes to competition, you're only going to send three students. Okay? 
Your school can have up to five teams compete in the South Carolina regional competition. Other regions allow one team, some regions allow three, but the max is five here in South Carolina. But in red, you'll notice it says only one of your teams can be in the final round of the competition. So the day that we do our regional competition, we have preliminary rounds, and then we have a final round that has our top three teams that compete with each other for the winner. Even if you had the top three teams from your school, only your top team is gonna advance to the, to the, um, the final round. That's just a rule that's in place so that you don't have legacy schools that dominate all the regional competitions. Um, look at page 11 in your handbook, this handbook that's in your folder. And you'll see it talks about team format options. It talks about your official team, your multiple teams, and then other team formats. So um, it's where it says other team formats. Some classrooms or clubs choose to work together as one team, dividing the work into smaller working groups, such as research group, a city model group. If you decide to work on this manner, in this manner, you'll need to select three students to serve as the official presenters for your regional competition. Um, for those folks that are new, um, I know sometimes you want to get as many people involved in the competition as possible, so you might think, I'm going to do those five teams. Just be leery, because as our, our people that did it last year for the first time can attest, it is, it, it is it's extensive, some things you have to go through. So you might not want to bite off more than you can chew the first year. Okay. Um, so you could, have, you could do the um, program at your school, and, and even if you don't decide to compete, which we hope you do, this is a learning program. It's not designed just to be a competition. So if you get into it and you, you're like, oh, there is no way that we can do all five of these deliverables, let us know. We can do something called Future City Light, which is where you turn in three deliverables and then you skip the other two. Of course, you don't have a chance to win, but you, you'll have a, a um, man, more manageable time frame of getting things turned in, if that's what you decide to do. Um, so just a show of hands, you do it as a club or a class? Class. Class. There you go. Put you in contact with that young man right there. So he would like to know how you do it as a class, okay? And you do it as a club. And Carol, you do it as a club or a well, class? Well, this year they're trying to do a class, so okay. we'll see. We're going to do it during the day where the students get to choose to be in it as opposed to being assigned. So I'm okay. hoping for that. <laughs> and, um, you know, it just, it's really going to vary at your school what works best. Um, some people have the luxury of having a class. Um, that could be a luxury or it could be, a, yeah, i, I got to come up with all this material just to do Future classes. City. Okay. So it's just doing Future City. Okay. Yeah, so St. Mary's, they did it as a class, and every student in eighth grade, I believe was, participated, and then they had a school competition which narrowed down to their five teams. If you do it that way, we'll talk about the timeline in a minute, you have to do that way ahead of time because things get turned in in December. The first thing gets turned in in December. So basically, you have to have your top teams by December. So the essay has to be done by December, right? The essay is the first thing. Right. <laughs> All right. Um, so the way the program, the framework of the program, is basically three strands. Okay. The creation of the city via your five competition deliverables mm -hmm. is the main strand. And then the other two are the engineering design process and project management. How many of you are familiar with either of those two things? Engineering design process or project management? The um, engineering design process, this is, uh, there's lots of them, but they kind of look the same. Okay. So you're going to be identifying the problem, learning your specifications, brainstorming your solutions, designing, building, testing, improving, maybe going around that a couple of times, <laughs> okay? And then the final part is the share it. That would be when you are turning things in and coming to the competition. Um, this is the the process that Future City uses, but they partner this with something called a project management cycle, okay? So this is the project management cycle. You're defining, you're planning, you're doing, and you're reviewing. 
If you look on page four in your handbook, you'll see they've done a nice job of showing you how those things fit together. So on the left hand side is the project management and then on the right hand side of that is the engineering design process, how those things work together. I'm not reading these slides to you, but just notice in your, um, there's a great link there that will take you to a website that has some really nice Down here there's a, a good video on what the engineering design process is, what the project management cycle is, and then how those two things work together. Those are really good. The project management cycle is um, where you really want to start in this competition. We're going to talk about that in just a second, because that's where you're going to start planning how you're going to go in your, your schedule for the competition. So you'll see define, that's where you're going to understand the challenge, you're going to learn about all the deliverables and requirements, and you're going to be setting your goals. Okay? And then when you get to the plan stage, you're going to create that schedule, you're going to start doing your research, you're going to work on your virtual city, you're going to start drafting your essay, and then under the do part is when you're going to be doing the check-ins, which we'll talk about, you're going to be finalizing your essay, you're going to start building your model and start working on your presentation. And you're gonna work through some testing and improving and redesigning. And then in your review stage is where you're gonna reflect on your project, let us know what worked, what didn't work, and then you're gonna present at the competition. So there's five deliverables for the competition part of it. Um, one is the city essay, two is the virtual city slideshow, Three is a city model, four is the presentation, and five is the project plan. If you look on page 22 of your handbook, this gives a specs of each of the deliverables. So the way this handbook is divided up is that in the, in the front, you have all of the, kind of just a general overview about each deliverable. And then as you go deeper into the handbook, it breaks it up into more detailed information about, about each component, which includes the rules and the rubrics and research. Um, each year, the competition addresses an annual citywide sustainability challenge. This year, it's clean water tapping tap into tomorrow. Okay? Last year, it was you had to create a resilient power grid. This year you're creating resilient water sources, so water, um, providing water for your city. So the essay, um, you're gonna be describing unique attributes about your city in a 1500 word maximum essay about the topic. The Research Essay is a place where you can really start to think big about your future city. What will the world look like? What technologies will you have invented? It's your city, so you get to decide. So work together to make sure that your essay is focused with logical ideas backed up by research. It was really fun researching everything and finding out a lot about the things that we were talking about. You will have to think like an engineer and solve the assigned problem head on with research, testing, and the design process. Writing the paper really helps tie everything together and it becomes the basis for your entire city. Your teacher or mentor will break down the structure of the essay so you'll know what's expected of you. This is your chance to explain how your city works. It is. It's actually really fun to write the essay because you get all this information and then you get to write it in something and send it to people who can actually do something about it. You, it's not like just writing it to your teacher and then she grades it and then says, oh, yay for you. It can get out and people like scientists and engineers can hear about it and 
they'll be like, oh, this is a cool idea, maybe they'll do something about it. Who cares if you get recognition for it? But if it, if it makes a difference, that's good. All right, so some more specifics as we delve into the essay. So this is where the team is going to describe the unique attributes of their city and provide the solution to this year's challenge. So the essay asks the students to imagine what would it be like to walk down a street in your city 100 years in the future, okay? What would you see? What would you smell? What would you feel? How would people live in your future city? You know, you, this is where you're, you're marketing your city, basically, to the judges. Maximum of 1,500 words. They have to cite at least three sources of information using MLA style as preferred. Um, Wikipedia is not recognized as an acceptable reference. Um, the educator or mentor must attest that the essay was written entirely by the students. That does not mean you cannot help them, okay? We want you to help them, but please don't write the essay or have a parent write the essay. This is that teaching tool of, you know, what is research? Research is new to a lot of sixth grade and seventh grade students, so that's a good skill to know and learn. Writing maybe is new to some of them as well. Um, there, it's up to 60 points is what you gain from this part of the competition. If you look on page 29, 29 delves into the essay. It gives you a suggested essay outline on page 30. It's just giving you some good information. And then if you turn over to 57, it's where it delves deeper into the essay topic, the, the deliverable itself, lots of um, research there for you, requirements of the essay, resources that you can look up, the way that it's scored, deductions that you might, that might occur. also goes into city design, things you might consider as you're talking in your essay about your city. And then on page 61, it goes more into this year's particular topic about clean water. And we just happen to have with us today an expert on city water. So I'm going to let Taylor introduce her, and then we will hear from her. So we have Michaela Day, and she works for City of North Augusta in Stormwater Management. Um, and she actually was a former student of Roberta Grinnell, so that was really neat. But um, Michaela is the environmental technician for the city and works closely with the construction and education side of things. In May of 2018, she graduated from USC Aiken with a bachelor's in environmental remediation and intends to continue her education with a master's degree in the near future. Her undergraduate research included population genetics of wood storks at USC Aiken and transposon, is that how you say it? Transposon. Oh, transposon mutagenesis in soybeans at UGA, and later radionuclide research with SREL before coming to work for the city in January of 2019. Michaela is honored to be here. She remembers how much of an impact Future City had on her fellow classmates from 96 South Carolina and is excited to see what this year has in store. So thank you so much, Michaela, for being here. So as Michaela's coming up, the challenge for this year is that, is that the students will choose a threat to the city's water supply and design a resilient system to maintain a reliable supply of clean drinking water. And you actually have her presentation in your folder. I'm curious question, the population of the city, is, it, is there a minimum population? Like, could it be a maximum? For instance, I mean, when we get to the, the Sim City part, there is. Okay, so I can make, it has to be a certain minimum population of the city design. Okay. Not for the, in the Sim City portion. Yes. Okay. said my name is Michaela and usually I work with the stormwater side of things but as we'll get into shortly 
Stormwater and drinking water can be very interconnected. So on our agenda today, we're going to talk about the different types of drinking water resources or where your water comes from, the threats to those water resources, how you can build a resilient system that can bounce back quickly if threatened, and then ways to prepare for the future of your future city, if you can prepare any more in the future than 100 years. So what type of water resource are you looking at? Are you looking at an aquifer? Is your water coming from snow melting off the mountains? Is it coming from a nearby lake, a river? or somewhere else. Whichever one you choose, you want to make sure that it's sustainable. If you choose a lake, you want to make sure that it's not going to dry up in 50 years, or your city might move the dam that's holding the lake there in another 50 years. Or if it's a groundwater aquifer, you need to make sure that it's not going to be infiltrated with salt water, like the one that we have nearest Charleston, maybe, in the future. Uh, if it's coming from snow, you need to ensure that climate change isn't going to change how much snow we get yearly, and things of that nature. As for North Augusta, our sole water source is the Savannah River. The Savannah River has two intakes where we take water from, about 0.4 miles apart from one another. We're not the only city that takes from the Savannah River. Um, Augusta takes water from that as well, so that's a thing you need to think about. And when we take in raw water, that's raw water directly from, straight from the river, it's really dirty. I wouldn't recommend drinking it like that. So it has to go through five different major processes. Um, but one of the coolest ones is flocculation, where they throw in this chemical and it makes the um, the sediment or the compounds come together and attach to one another and then sink to the bottom. And they take the clean water off the top. And another one of the processes I'd like to point out is sedimentation, which my job comes in handy in that process. So in North Augusta, we have a 30 million gallon per day secondary water reservoir that we use in case the water quality in the river is poor. We don't have a secondary source, we just have stored water. And that water tank can last the city five to seven days if the water quality is too poor to drink from the river after being cleaned, um, which isn't a lot of time when you think about giving drinking water to 30,000 people for any period of time. <coughs> and that water at the plant is monitored for alkalinity, how much bacteria was in the water before it was taken in or how much bacteria is in the water when it's returned to the river or uh, turbidity, pH, all those other things. So already we're thinking about questions that we need to ask when we're building our future city. Where is your city located? Is it a port city on the coast? Is it um, a river city beside a river? Is it in the middle of the desert? because that's gonna, that's gonna dictate where you can get your water from. Like the city of Atlanta, they get their water from the Chattahoochee River. Or the county of Washington in Utah, they get their water from the snow melting off the nearby mountains. Uh, another example would be Norfolk, Virginia. They get their water from several different locations, including three lakes, four deep wells, and two rivers. So that's a plethora of backup water sources. And also you need to think about um, how many people are going to be in the city, how many people need water that you are responsible for getting that to in case of emergencies. Um, like I said previously, that there's going to be more people than just you pulling from that water source, most likely. Um, how much drinking water can your plant produce for the city, um, which is a big thing with our new water plant. And have you thought about backup water sources or water sources that you might need to pick up later in the future that aren't available at the moment? This is a picture of our water plant back in 2014 when it was being built.
2007 drought was a big factor in this being built because it was really scary. It, uh, the water level in the river was very low. Even the city of Atlanta was trying to pull water from the Savannah River because they didn't have enough in the Chattahoochee River. Yeah, it was a big deal. And so they built this just in case we ever needed that much water again.
due to drinking water contamination, which is good for no one because we need water to survive. So if you manage your stormwater, technically you're protecting your drinking water. So bringing back to this picture to point out, this is when the water plant was under construction and you can see the open land at the top of the photo and that red line is a creek that runs into the Savannah River. Well, if you go down the river a little bit, there's our intake point for our drinking water. So while we were building, we had to make sure that it was a double row of silt fence, that black fence that you see on construction sites to protect the river or the creek from the sediment coming off of the construction site. One of our biggest problems is construction site sediment movement into creeks and streams and then into rivers. It changes hydrologic um, ways of moving in the river. It changes vegetation growth or types of vegetation that grows. It can do a lot of damage to uh, an ecosystem. And it can do a lot of damage to the water as you can see, it's really murky. We're in the area where it's usually murky after a rain event, but this is a little bit too murky for that, meaning there's a lot of sediment in the water. Suspended so total suspended solids is a, a big thing that we look at as um, stormwater managers and how much sediment is in the water because we have to manage construction sites. So back to drinking water, some of the threats that has to do with stormwater and drinking water would be, we've already mentioned, one big one, flooding. When Columbia flooded, there was a lot of infrastructure damage, bridges, pipelines, whether that be sewer, storm, drinking water, it all, it's all interconnected because if one's down, then the others suffer. Um, the opposite of that problem would be drought, not enough rain. <laughs> which is a big problem now because one of the most populated cities in India just ran out of water recently. That's scary. What if New York City ran out of water? That would be, that, I can't imagine, that would be awful. Um, climate change, I mentioned that in the beginning. What if the weather patterns change so drastically that flooding and drought are more frequent than they are now? And how would a city bounce back from that? This is a picture of the Savannah River at Savannah Barony Subdivision at the Shoals. It looks a little bit more intimidating than it was, but still if you walk up to the Savannah River and it's usually full of water and you see only rocks, that's kind of terrifying. Um, so this is one big reason why the city administrator was very motivated to get our water plant up and running. Some more threats, bacteria, pathogens, are always a big deal. Whether that be from pet owners leaving their pet waste on the side of the road and then going into the stormwater and then into the river, or so much development is putting animals in one condensed space and then they use the bathroom there and it goes into the river, or the creek, and then into the river. So that can be Agriculture, pesticides, fertilizers, all that washes off of agricultural fields into creeks, into rivers, causing algal blooms, which I'm, per I'm sure you've heard about in the news lately because they are toxic to humans as well as pets. Um, there's sewer leaks. Stormwater can get into your sewer system, overflow your sewer lines and manholes, and then seep into the groundwater or into uh, your river water, which is nasty, deadly. Um, so, and septic tanks are always, septic tank failures are always something cities look at because if your, if your city has septic tanks in one area, that watershed is more prone to be filled with bacteria than the ones that are on actual city sewer. And one big one that people don't like to think about, but it's there. Terrorism, terrorism. <coughs> people use water sources to attack populations of people and a city should be able to secure water sources very quickly in the event that it were to get attacked. So preparing for all these setbacks and 
and making it a little bit more positive, I think it's all doable to prepare for any type of setback that I've mentioned today. You have to have a backup water source, whether that be a storage tank, another river, getting it from another state, or elsewhere, shipping water in, if that's a possibility, do it. Make sure you have a backup water source for your customers and residents in the case of an emergency. Prepare for the worst case scenarios if you can, whether it be a huge flood or a massive drought, make sure you're prepared in an emergency such as that. Have an asset management, asset management program. Know where your infrastructure is, because that's a big thing. Know how big it is, know how old it is, and whether it will need to be replaced in the next however many years. So you prepare to replace it before it fails and it saves your city money. And budget for that money, because you have to budget and make things You have to pay for this. Money's always an issue. <laughs> Uh, manage for stormwater, because if you manage for stormwater, then you're managing your drinking water. And the biggest, probably one of the hardest things to do is educating your citizens. Make sure they value water. Make sure they only use it when it's needed. Have workshops such as this or other opportunities in place to educate your citizens about picking up after their pet, if it's that simple. Or other things like managing a construction site. Make sure your contractors know that their sediment can impact other people's drinking water. Um, and with that, if you have any questions, well, that's the end of my Another one. Sure. 30 million, 30 million gallon backup tank for a population of what size? 30,000. 30,000. So if you had a, would it, would it recommend that we're 30,000, 30 million gallons, wouldn't North Augusta be better served if it's only a five to seven, day, seven week, five to seven day backup, wouldn't it be best if North Augusta either had more than one reservoir tank? Oh, I agree. Um, we you, should have more than one reservoir would, tank. I mean, I would imagine you would, rest, you would want a minimum of at least four to maintain a backup supply of over 30 days, because it would take that many days to recover a damage to the river supply. Right, I agree. Um, but that's cool. that goes back to cost. Right, but also oh. it does. So we, we um, service North Augusta and Belvedere, right. which is 30,000 30, people. Um, and we have our daily tanks, that's 5 million gallons, and they supply. Those are like the big water tanks? Oh, the in the city? Saw off to the side. Yeah, but what about those little city water tanks? Those, hold, those, those back up for how many gallons? 50,000? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I you have so that in. Those are how many how many years old? And they have a backup right. in each little area. I know that North Augusta is at least four or five of those. Right. Each right. little community. I didn't even think about that. I thought they were like 5,000. I need a five, 10,000 gallons. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. The last time I got an antibiotic, they actually gave me stuff that if I didn't, or whatever medicine it was, if I didn't finish taking it, I was supposed to pour this pack in it, add water, and it dissolved the medication and like destroyed the medication. And I wasn't supposed to flush it. So I, I don't know if that's going to be a norm anymore. And I wish I remembered if it was antibiotic. I can't remember. So. That sounds like a great engineering opportunity. I can say it if there is a, and I, Not a hundred years, let's do it tomorrow. Well, yeah. There is some testing done right now for parts per billion of pesticide residuals or chemicals. There are only, as far as, 
Well, I work with virtual food safety with some for several beach farms as well as apple farms, and we have to send stuff off. We collect water samples of ponds that we irrigate, and to maintain the safety level for making sure that our fruit is safe to go to the public, we actually test not only the flesh of the fruit, but also the skin of the fruit. We send it off to California. Unfortunately, in this, con this country, there's only about three areas, three locations. One of them is in Pasadena, California. One's in New York that will actually test for every element in the pesticide manuals, as well as basic chemicals for hormone growth. And we have a certain limitation. Um, the government has a limit standard of what is acceptable residual limits. And as long as you can actually maintain that, your, their, your product is considered safe. So, but a lot of companies, because of the cost of the testing, yeah. most people ignore it. And it's sad. Well, with three lives, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a wait list. Huh? I'm sure turnaround with just three lives is kind well, of slow. Well, our turnaround, was, well, it, it is slow. So we <coughs> normally have our fruit um, start harvesting in, in late April, May. We send our samples off usually by the first week of May. We get our results back by like the first, second week of June. Wow. So it takes a month to get our results back. But since we know exactly the residual limits are there and testing, the testing schedule was perfect for the year before, so we maintain our, our, our spraying of our crops and using the same schedule, with the same concentration limits, so that we can expect that our, our crop comes back with the right levels. And of course, if they don't, we have um, uh, we developed a safety pr protocol that maintains how we would treat the irrigation ponds. Uh, we basically, uh, we get those test water sample tests back usually within two days. So we, have a special, so we can actually test water continually throughout the season. Uh, if any level, we had one case where one pond came up, which we weren't using irrigation yet, but we came up too high on, on certain conditions, so we basically bioshock the pond to limit. There is chemicals you can buy that are bioshock and eliminate Flock. the E. coli. Hmm? Yeah, it's the flocculation that she yes. was talking about. Right. It'll kill the, it'll, it's a bioshock chemical that we basically put into, we go out to the pond, little roba, go out to the center of the pond, dump it in there and let it circulate. We use the pumps that basically draw the water out and shoot it right back into the pond to circulate it to kill the germs. Then we test the water for various, um, you know, I have certain things I can say, I can't say. Well, I mean, I, I did get, I did sign a letter of you know, confident, confidentiality, but I'm just saying we make sure, we don't use the water until the test levels come back to an acceptable norm, which basically uh, we use the same standard that it has to be considered swimming, swimming water, lake water, like for recreational water, our ponds, our, our ponds and irrigation um, reservoirs have to maintain the same level over a period of six to eight months. That would be basically recreational uh, water by the EPA. So th that's all information that's you know out there. For Another question. Um, your the slide where you talk about potential threats. Am I thinking straight when? For this year's challenge, they get to pick a natural disaster. It doesn't have to be a natural it disaster. It doesn't have to a be a natural, just any threat. Mm -hmm. Last year it was a natural disaster for the energy resilience okay. city, but this year it's just a threat. Okay, thank you. There are so many different threats you can have to consider. Yeah. And you gave us a list. You gave us some good ones, so yeah. thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. That was really good. So, as a invitation, I guess formal or informal, as you, if you'll take it that way, we have an event with the city. It's called Eco Meet. It's also for middle schoolers coming up on November first. If you haven't heard about it, it's for mostly CSRA schools. But if you're out of CSRA, I'm hosting it, so I, I think I can make a um, exception. An exception. Definitely. <laughs> so there's a couple of brochures. I'll leave them up here on this table if you're interested. Just pick those up before you leave. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. A couple of things that were laying on your table when you got in. Um, I came across a couple of posters that were was from the um, USGS 
One was on groundwater, and then one was on just water usage overall. Um, you're, you're welcome, because these cost, yes. I found them, they're a dollar a piece now, so you got them for free. But also, um, I have a, I looked up the website because I was trying to order more. Unfortunately, I can't afford them now. But I have a listing. You can download them from their website and um, print them. I just printed a couple on 11 by 17 paper like that. So I have that sheet. You can pick that up as well. It just has the resource, all sorts of water resources, not just the poster, but all sorts of water resources. All right. So, any questions before we move past the essay? Okay. I need my handbook. So, the next thing we're going to talk about is the project plan. So, I mentioned earlier project plan is where you sort of want to start your program um, because you want to. Page 25 in the, or I'll just say 25 is just that brief introduction of what the project plan is, how you can start creating that schedule for yourself. Page 26 talks about the project plan deliverable, but if you'll fly over to 41, that's the section, the, the appendix section that goes more into detail about what the project plan is. There is, um, if you look on page 42, there's three, four parts to the project plan. And the project part one is where you're going to be setting your goals for your team. Part two is where you're going to be creating that schedule. Part three is where you're going to be checking in throughout the four to five months. And then part four is where you're going to be reflecting on the project. This is a 10 point part of the competition. If you do all four point four parts, you get all ten parts. You all get all ten points. Okay, so we're not going to read it and grade you on um, how well you wrote or anything. You just do it. You get the ten points. If you don't do it, you don't get the ten points. In this competition, if you're doing it for a competition, a tenth of a point makes a difference. So ten points will make a huge difference. So don't forget about the project plan. Please start thinking, and that's really going to guide you by setting up that schedule thinking about what are your goals going to be for your teams. Um, it's due about a week prior to the competition. You upload it to the website, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, the Word document contains all four parts of the project plan. It can be downloaded at the resources section of the Future City website. And then they can type on it? Yep, it's a fillable PDF. <coughs> and it's also in your handbook also want to take a look at and it goes into details about the schedule, about checking in, about reflecting. So. Thank you for the actual copy. Yes. I, I get it online, but it's, it's on YouTube. I like it. Yeah, Thank and, you. And, and um, for those people that are new to this, this really is Consider your future city Bible. So really you joke about it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, read it. Just read it. You, know, you need to start. Yeah. Don't don't skip anything. It, is a, it can be overwhelming, but it has all the information you need in it. Mm -hmm. And it does a really good job of breaking things down into finite details. See, I didn't even notice that it was breaking it down until I said mm -hmm. So, thank you. <laughs> Done my job. Okay. So those are those four parts. Uh, the virtual city part um, of the, the virtual city deliverable is the third deliverable. And this is the last year of the virtual city deliverable in the format that it is now. Um, SimCity is the game that we've been using up until this point for the Virtual City part of the competition. Um, EA Games is the people that make that. They no longer support that technology. Um, and so we are operating on sort of dust SimCity codes that they've given us, but they're about to run out and we won't, they won't have any more. 
So um, for those people that have been with the competition for a long time, hopefully there's going to be something that replaces this, or they'll just do away with one of the deliverables, which might be good also. Uh, so my students were talking about the fact that there are some aspects of that you could do with Minecraft. Okay, and that might be something that they're looking at. Because I know they've been looking at a lot of other technologies, whether it be some sort of um, presentation, video, and they might, if they can, get enough copies, maybe one copy per school, just to use it as a resource. Because it is a really good resource. Um, so what Virtual City is, students are designing a virtual city using a game called SimCity. Is everybody familiar or heard of SimCity? If you've not, your students, I'm sure, probably have. I say that, but then it's becoming so old that they may not know that now. But SimCity is a gaming software. They will pick it up very fast. Okay? And we have an expert with us today who's going to show you um, towards the end of the workshop about SimCity if you're interested. Um, it is a great learning tool, not just to play a game, but for them to learn about the complexities of building a city. They need to figure out where do they put the roads? Why do you put a road certain place? Why do you need a bridge? Why do you need a school? Why do you need hospitals? Why do you need taxes? Is the mayor happy? Is are the residents happy? You know, why don't you put your city? Why don't you put your houses right in the middle of a factory area? Well, you know, you have, you know, do you, are your residential? Um, do you make more money on houses that are up against a river or out in the woods? So it, it just gives them ideas on city planning. That's what the tool is all about. The competition used to be where you built the best future city in SimCity and that's what you were judged on. It's no longer that. For this deliverable now, the students choose two goals that they want to achieve. Okay, there's sample goals on page 53 in your handbook. So let's say maybe they want to, they said, okay, we want to have um, Resilient power grid. We want to make sure that our city is a green city. We want to make sure our city is free of pollution. So these are just some sample goals. It doesn't have to be any of these. These are just samples. And then they work towards match meeting these goals. They're not scored on whether they meet the goals, but they're scored on working towards the goals. So the scoring is largely based on the learning they demonstrate rather than their final city. If you look on the page 54, that gives you an example of one of the rubrics on how you're scored for that. But also, and if you look too in your folder, there's actually a template. Yes, thank you. That's what I was looking for. Yes. So there's this is a template on how you do it, and then this actually gives you an example. So when John was talking about those goals, like there's there's an example. With but a lot of the teams do use these goals in the book. And if you do use that goal, typically you get your points because that's one of the ones that's been given by nationals. So the thing you have in there, like she said, is a sample template and then one that's an example of someone, a school that, a competition team that was filled out. So what they're doing is, they're, the, the thing you're putting in there is you're putting in what are your goals. And then you're checking in to tell us um, at a certain number of population, what's going on in your city. Are you meeting your goals? If not, what are you going to do now to change things so that you can work towards your goals? So you're giving a couple of progress reports as you go along at certain population levels. And that's in your handout for you. And just make sure, too, so you'll have to do a PowerPoint that you delete all this extra blue, like it gives you tips and stuff. Just make sure you delete that. Because sometimes we see them turned in, and they still have all this extra writing, and then our judges are seeing that. so. But yet, yeah, utilize these resources. They will help you tremendously. Does SimCity work on Chromebooks? I don't believe so. Um, um, do you know, Penny? Does it, it work does on not, Chromebook? It does not. It doesn't work on Windows 10 either. It doesn't work on Windows. So what does it work on? Windows 7, 7. and um, anything so less than 10. The Mac OS. Okay. So. Has to be something less than Windows 10. Well, you should be able to, even if you do have Windows 10, you should be able to open it up in, in, a, uh, in a lesser version. They do have uh, compatibility modes that you should be able to open up. Okay. Windows has compatibility. Windows has compatibility modes. Okay. 
So the resources that you'll receive for the virtual city, you will get two codes per school. Um, those two code, each code can be installed on five computers. So ultimately you could have 10 computers operating SimCity based on those two codes that you'll receive. Um, you may need to work with your district if sometimes districts have gaming blocks because the very first thing you have to install is something called Origins. And if you can't get around the Origins, you won't be able to have the game on your school computers. A lot of people will do this on external laptops, teach student laptops, anything like that, or at home, whatever, you have, whatever is the best technology part. And that's one of the reasons, the other part of the reason is we're trying to get away from SimCity as well, because there are technology issues across the country. Um, you'll get the templates that we talked about, there's the benchmarks, the rubric that we talked about, the related instructions on how to take the screenshots, where to find the statistics for your benchmarks, all of that information is provided for you. Um, cities can be designed in any region. When you start building your city, you can design in any region. Um, your kids will know about cheat codes probably. Cheat codes are, dis are discouraged, but they're not forbidden. However, if they use them, they have to record it on their benchmark under financial aid. Because if you go from a budget or from taking in zero money and all of a sudden you have $10 million, we know something's up, so you got to make sure you have that captured under the benchmark sheet. Sandbox mode is not allowed. And then we try, it's not required, but your city name, your future city name, would be great to be also your team name. So when you start playing in the Sim City, call it what your team name is, your future city name is. That's going to help you as well as us when you get ready to turn things in. If you've got it called Team 2, but your city name is Alakazam or something like that, you know, it's, if you name them all the same, it'll be easier for you to keep up. Um, after you have registered and then you've gone in and done the second part of the registration, which is where you put in your program details, um, that's where it asks you how many students are at your school, free and reduced lunch numbers, how many people are participating, how many teachers, all of that. Your codes are automatically sent to the teacher center on the Future City website. If you, it says three codes here, but if you'd like to request more than two codes, you can info, you can email info at futurecity.org with the number of codes requested and the number of students that are in your program, and they'll see if they can give you extra codes. Not guaranteed, though, as they are starting to run out. The SimCity download instructions, this does, on this next page, give you some instructions about like the Windows, when we were talking about the Windows 7. And then it does say that SimCity is not officially supported on Windows 8 or Windows 10, though players should still be able to build their city using these operating systems. So it gives you a link to go to. So this would be a good thing to give to our technology yes. person. Yes, to see if they can help you get that. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you go to that teacher page in the Future City website, this is what it will look like. Over, over on the left-hand side where it says Educators page, that's what you'll click on, and you'll come down to SimCity codes, and it'll give you two, it'll have two codes listed oh. there. Um, when you go to futurecity.org, you log in. That the login that you set up when you registered, you log into that, and then it'll take you right to this page. Okay. All right, the model. I have an example of a model over here. Is that anybody's model from this room? Does that belong to you, Margo? Does that look familiar? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I have a couple of models over there. Um, that's an example of one of the models. The um, model is it's a physical model of a section of their future city. Okay? You don't have to show the entire future city on that piece of board. Okay? You want to show a section of your future city. And what it will really depend on is how you set your scale, because the students have to set a scale for their model. I would recommend you're starting with your largest structure and then working backwards on that. So it's your largest structure and then that'll help you set your scale. Um, your mom, we'll talk about, we're gonna show a little video and then we'll talk about the specifics.
We built this city on rock. Don't don't film me singing. planned, marketed, and researched your virtual city. Now comes the fun part, building the model. This is your chance to give judges a 3D look at what one section of your city would look like. Your model is not of your entire city. Choose a section that shows a variety of your city's best features. There are examples of past models on the website to inspire you. You may only spend a total of $100 on all materials, including those used in support of your verbal presentation. Using recycled materials helps cut costs. The final model may not exceed a width of 25 inches, a length of 50 inches, or a height of 20 inches. I was more into science before I got into this competition, but I think I have learned a lot about engineering and I really like it. Not one engineer goes into one project. A bunch of different kinds of engineers, like in order to make this, you don't not only need a geothermal, but you need mechanical, electrical, environmental. You need so many engineers just to get that one plant done. All right, so again, it is just a physical model of a section of your city. It also needs to show the solution to this year's challenge. So somewhere in that model, when your kids are doing their presentation, they're gonna to point to an area and say, this is where we created the, um, we engineered the medication filtering, plastic filtering system that you're gonna come up with, okay? Um, cannot exceed $100. That $100 is for the presentation and the model. So as you build this, you're gonna be building this with recycled materials. Um, the model does not need to be, like I said, an exact building by building duplication of your virtual city. Okay? The SimCity game is not very futuristic. Okay? Again, future, virtual SimCity is there as a tool to show them about city planning. You're not designing your future city in SimCity. Okay? That confuses some people. So just know that you don't have to build your model based on your SimCity. But you do want to identify and build the best features of your city. You know, if you have a, a dome that encompasses all of your homes in your city, put that on your model. That's kind of cool, you know. Um, you want to show the, the challenge. You want to determine your scale. It also has to have at least one moving part. It can be a part that you move, but the, the wow factor is when it moves on its own. And it needs to be can't be electrical. It can be, as long as it's battery operated. Okay, Just battery. can't plug it in. Okay. Yep, mm -hmm. there are, you go to nationals, you look at the back of some of these models, they got 15 okay. switches okay. and it's wire, they got their dad's help to do a bunch of wiring. When you look at this, I mean, that's really pretty, but it's just like crystal white containers and Pringles containers and CDs and Christmas ornaments, things that did not cost a lot of money. A green bottle, and it yeah. could be donated stuff. But be careful, we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Even though it's donated, right. it still has a value. Right. Don't think you can get a thousand dollar thing donated <laughs> and count at zero. So be careful with that, okay? So it does have to have that one moving part. No electrical wires, no live animals, please. No perishable items or hazardous materials. We did have a really cool model one year that had um, this dome structure, but it was made out of, um, it had a lot of marshmallows, which were perishable. So if that had made, if that had won to go to nationals, that might have made it to national competition. So be careful with your perishable items. So the model dimensions, for those people that are 
veterans to the competition. This is a little bit different this year, so I want you to listen. It can be no longer, the size is the same, 20 inches high, 50 inches long, and 25 inches wide. It used to be that, that if you had a drawer that pulled out, or if you had something that lifted up, or you had the, something that spread out, it had to fit within that dimension. Now it's just, when it's all put together, it has to be those dimensions. So you could have something that flips up now, that goes outside of those dimensions, with, that you use during your presentation. Like a backdrop. Like a backdrop that might pick up, that might fold up. But, it, but at resting, it needs to it be to. at that set. Um, it can be, um, if the, let's see, it said pin. It is permissible to have extended parts such as access doors, compartments, and hinge pullouts, as long as they are fully self supported by the model. Okay? Or, if you pull it out and it's removable, it has to be held in your hand. You can't lay it on the table for it to be another part of the model. Okay, so if you pull something off the model, it needs to stay in your hand until you put it back on the model. You're trying to allow a little bit more freedom and creativity rather than restricting students. Um, you'll, if you go to the website and watch some of the presentations from nationals, rotating models are very popular rotate on a lazy Susan so you can show the front of the city and then you turn it back and you can show another part of the city or the end has another part of the city and this end has another part of the city. Those are very popular and uh, they are allowed. So the total value of the materials in the model as well as your presentation has to be within $100. That includes color copying, printing, visual aids, costumes, or other demonstration aids. Let's look at page 94 so we can talk about this expense sheet that you got to fill out. Be careful with this. Please don't mess up. Okay? So if you'll look down at where it says examples, you're going to fill out one of these for the competition where you're going to list all the materials that you have used. Notice this 4x8 plywood sheet, $20, but they only used half of it. It got put in the purchase column and they recorded it for $10. But they got some paint on the next level donated but that paint has, still has some value. Think about if you were to sell it at your yard sale, what would the value be, okay? But the next thing was a two liter soda pop bottle. You literally got that out of the recycle bin, so it is a zero. So think about truly something that's in a recycle bin is zero. A piece of wood is not, paint is not. A costume that somebody lets you borrow is not a zero. Okay, even if somebody gave it to you, even if somebody donated to you. I just always say, give everything a value and then you're good. And just, just be safe. Because what happens is, the day of the competition, we have a mean old judge that comes around with your score, with your thing, gonna look at that model and say, oh, you didn't list this on your model, how much does that cost? If it's not on there, maybe you're at $99.99. You don't have a problem. Okay, so just be careful. We want to make it fair to everybody. So but like, be creative. Like that stuff over there would be zero. Yes. Or that 3D printer thing would now be Now there is a car cost for 3D printing, and you'll see that in somewhere in the book. It talks about what 3D printing has a value, what it costs well, for 3D printing. Well, that is like trashed 3D printing. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you, it's kind of like that motherboard of the scrap computer. They only gave it a 250. Mm -hmm. So we probably right. need to give that a value, yeah, right? Give it a okay. dollar value or something. Okay, gotcha. If you printed it at your school though on your, on your it 3D printer, more. it would be more. Right, okay. Just give it a value. Give it a value. Okay. Um, also, start collecting those items now. I, mm -hmm. I, I, all, all the time in my house, I have these crystal light containers. I'm like, oh, these would be great hotels. These would be great houses. All kind of stuff. Just start, you know, put a box in your room and have the kids bring in a bunch of stuff. That, that I'm giving cool. all my kids a paper bag and they're taking it home and yeah, they're going to start putting stuff, stuff in it. Yeah, because you'll be amazed what you can come up with. Um, consider the weight and mobility, though. During the judging, you're going to have to move your model. So if they're, like, super duper heavy, you, you don't want to move them from in your room. Also, if you win, it's got to ship to nationals, oh. okay? And um, you want to make sure that it can be shipped, that it's not so heavy. The model is worth 70 points. The scoring rubric is on page 75. So the, everything up until this point, the deliverables, 
have been turned in prior. The model is, is the thing you bring to the day of the competition, January 25th. Also, the presentation is the next thing that we're going to talk about. But before we do that, any questions about the model? Again, there's lots of information. I really, really want you to go out and look at the resources or gallery section on the futurecity.org website. You will see some amazing models. They take pictures of all the regional winners and put those pictures of models up there so you can see what the winning models look like. You said our regional was January 25th? January 25th. And where is that at? Here in the business and education. Okay. Huh. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not in the stack. It's it's here in the USA. USA. Okay, gotcha. Sorry, the, for those people that have been around for a while, the B&E gym where we normally have it is going to be something's going on, remodeling or renovating or something, so we have to move it to a different location this year on campus. So it's going to be a little different, so just bear with us for those people that we may not have individual classrooms like we've had before where it may be like a corner in a, this draped off with some pipe and drape or something like that. So maybe a little different. Just there with us. <laughs> it's the only space we could find that would house this large of a competition. And we're going to talk about some um, date specific things in just a second. All right, so the presentation. You've, You've designed, designed researched, and, and modeled, and now, and now it's time, time to show off all that hard work and, and convince the judges that, that your city design, design is the best. The city we bring to yeah. you is Glyde Salika, the city of Elk. You'll have seven minutes to present your city and then defend your design during a five to eight minute Q&A session. This is a team effort. Everyone has to speak during the presentation. You'll identify and describe city features using your city model, props, and visual aids. Visual aids can include display boards, flip charts, costumes, and brochures. Remember your budget for your model and presentation materials together must come in under $100 and no computers and videos are allowed. Even if I don't end up being an engineer, it still helps me with like my leadership skills and my collaboration skills and my speaking skills. So it's a really useful, fun project. The judges will want to know what types of engineering make your city tick. They award points on delivery, presentation, and how knowledgeable your answers are. Most people don't realize how important communication skills are to being a successful engineer. Communication skills and presenting is a huge part of your life as an engineer. Once you get that first engineer job and all through your career, that's going to be the whole ticket to your success. You might have the most phenomenal ideas, but if you can't impart them and communicate them to either your client or your peers, it doesn't matter. All successful engineers must be able to present their ideas in writing and in person. Well, if they aren't good communicators, they're a bad engineer. All right, so your students are going to give a, the day of the competition, they're going to give a seven minute, really five to seven minute presentation about the features of their city and talking about the design ch or the challenge for this particular year. And then following that, they have a five to eight minute period where the judges will ask them questions. Those judges can ask them anything they want. There's some mandatory questions that everybody gets asked, but they could ask them anything We'll provide you sample questions that the judges could ask, and a lot of times the questions they will ask will come from those sample questions. So when we send those out to you, I encourage you to work with your students on those questions. Um, the students are, should be able to identify and explain the features of their city, describe the innovations, the special features, the key aspects. This is where they're selling their project to the judges. So when you, if you're working with more than three students on this project, that's where you're going to pick the three students who are going to present the best to come to the competition. You want your little actors or public speakers to be your team. Um, you also want to demonstrate teamwork when you're during your presentation. You don't want one person doing the presentation all by themselves. You want to make sure that it's shared work. Also with the questions, it's always a good idea that not the same person answers all the questions. I, I've noticed in 15 more years of doing this, the teams that do really, really well is when a question is asked, all three of the students answer the questions. Somebody, all three of the students give some sort of answer.
So pages 34 and 78 are where it breaks those, de those com different um, components of the city presentation down. We've got, let's look real quick on page 78. This is important um, as you start working on your visual aids and props. Um, so if you look down at the bottom of 78 where it talks about um, visual aids and props, so the display boards, you can use flip, you know, flip charts, phone boards, poster boards, things like that. They can't exceed the parameters that are listed here. So you can have no larger than 24 by 36 poster boards, 25 by 30 flip charts, or 36 by 40 trifold boards. You can have up to two flip charts or poster boards showed at the same time, or one of those like science fair project boards. But let's say this is a um, an easel, and you have a you have a board here, and you have a board here. You can have 15 of these things stacked right here. This one behind you show another. You can move this one as long as it's only two showed at the same time. Or one of the science fair backwards shown at one time. <coughs> Any questions about the presentation? Okay. I know it's overwhelming, but you really can do it. Just like we want to give you as much information right now as possible. Um, the rubrics, like we said, are all of this, all available to you. They're online. They're also after each section breakdown in the book. If you score yourself, you should kind of have a good idea of maybe what you're going to be scored at. Um, before you submit, judge yourself. Virtual this page numbers for all of the rubrics. Um, next, we're going to talk about the timeline when things are deliver when the deliverables are due. I'm going to let Taylor talk to you about that. You have a copy of this in your, in your um, thing. It's on a kind of a tan sheet of paper with some bright colors. It should be on the left side of your folder. And when he was talking about like the city presentation, if you go out to YouTube and you search Feature City National 2019, you can actually see the top five teams' presentation. And that just might help you to kind of see what their model looked like, what their presentation was like, because they are very well prepared for this. What was that again, the search? If you go to YouTube and you just type and in. And I'll show you, it's actually on the, the Future on their, City website. Yeah, mm -hmm. Future City um, Nationals 2019. You can pull up, and, it, and so what they do is they have their top five winners that actually come on stage and do their presentation. But that's a great way, I mean, this kid, I was blown away. I was actually one of the official round timers at the end, so right there in front of them. But it was awesome to see how good these kids do on stage. So. With the timeline, this is something that you definitely want to keep up with because this is very important. This has all of our due dates for Future City. So you're already at our first things at the top with our, team, our um, workshop. And so right now you want to start thinking about securing a mentor. So some people already have a mentor. Um, if you don't have one, this could be someone out in your community. It could even be a teacher in your school that you could ask engineering questions to. It could be someone that you call on the phone or you do it via email. Um, and if you really, if you cannot find someone, you can email me. I can try to see if I can find someone at work. It just depends. Um, and so then, so your first deliverable that's going to be due is your virtual city slides that John was talking about. So that will be due December 11th. Uh, we give you two days to let it be turned in late, so you will lose points if it's late. But the absolute deadline is December 13th for virtual city. So if, if you don't turn it in, then after that it will be a C. And getting a zero in your first deliverable will really hurt you in competition. So there's really kind of no way you could be a top team without that. Now, you can still win special awards, but just to let you know, if you're going for those top team spots, you really need to turn in all of these. Um, the next thing is going to be the city essay. So this is going to be right after Christmas, so it's definitely something you want to be working on before Christmas. So this is due at J on January the 8th by midnight. Um, it's the same thing, five points if it's late, January 10th, and then if you don't turn that in, you also get a zero. But that's something you can already be talking about and get some ideas um, for that as well. The final team information, this is due January 15th. This is very important because John works extremely hard 
to set up the schedule and to set up the rooms and then we, we get all of our judges together. So if you could really have all your final team information in. And this is going to be the names of your students and that name of your city. So all those things are very important. Because um, I know last year, like the day before competition, a team had dropped out. And if you know you're not going to be able to do it, it's just better to go ahead and tell us because it makes it a lot easier on our part. We don't want judges who have volunteered their Saturday sitting around doing nothing the whole day. So, I mean, do you, do you agree? Yeah, that this, it's, if, if, if you can you know, give us that information on the 15th and know before the 15th if you're going to compete. Know right. before Christmas break. You know? And, and right. you want to check with your students, make sure that you don't have they're not going to all of a sudden be going on a band competition. Or there's a Duke or testing that basketball. day, or there's a basketball game. You know, those schedules are, you might, you should know those schedules right. ahead of time. Yeah. So hopefully they will have that information. And like um, Taylor was saying, we just had some schools that, you know, turned everything in, and then three or four of them dropped out. And, you know, three teams dropped out, that puts some really big holes. It does. And you can't shift, well, I did shift everything, and then some people came back. Shift it all yeah, it was a lie. It was like the craziness the day before, getting it ready. But we did it, so. But yeah, so you could turn in all that final team information. And also with your city name, think about a name that's easy to pronounce. If you come up with a crazy name, we're probably not going to say it right when we're on stage. So just think about that um, when, when you are planning your students. Or it can be whatever you want, but just you want us to say it right. Yes, <laughs> yes. So if, if, if it's a difficult one, we might get it wrong. Um, the project plan, that's going to do, be due on January 17th. There is no late deadline for this one, but that one really is an easy deliverable. I mean, y'all have done it before. That one's not too bad, right? It, it's the easiest one you're going to do. And then, um, we, so the competition is January 25th, um, and we'll let you know the for sure time for that. But you can have an, we do have an early check-in on January 24th. So you can go ahead and bring in your model and get it set up. Sometimes that's just easier than having to do it all that Saturday. And we're going to try this year. I know in the past we've gone around and done the model expense verification at your tables in the gym. This year we're going to try to do that when you're registering to try to take away some of that. Um, if you've never done Future City before, we have special award judging going on at the same time, and it gets a little crazy. So we're trying to, to switch some stuff up. And then um, the winner will then travel to Future City Finals February 15th through 19th in Washington, D.C. Last year was my first experience, and it is really cool. If you ever get, the, get a chance to go, it is awesome. And that's part of it, you thought it was amazing, right? That's an all-expense-paid trip for yes. those five, those three students, the teacher, and the mentor. Yes. So, and the main thing is we want you to have fun with this. We want you to enjoy it. We want your students to enjoy it. We want them to have a good time today at competition. And I see where they learn so much, and even just the presentation skills they get. That's something that's difficult for all of us to get up in front of people and to have to speak. And it's awesome at middle school, they're able to get up and talk for five to seven minutes to judges and then answer a question. So just the fact of them competing, whether they win or they don't win, it's, that's just, it's remarkable and it's an accomplishment for them. You want me to go and talk about well, anything else? I just wanted to say, don't hate me as we get closer to all the deliverables. You will be getting Lots reminder emails or reminder emails. It's just to keep you right. being reminded so of what, how to turn things in, what, what it needs to be done, <laughs> all the specifics yes. of it. So. And you will be getting emails from me and John. And, and I believe you asked for like t-shirt sizes and all that kind of stuff. So you will get emails from both of us where we need you to answer those questions. And it's really just to get us prepared for you. I'm going to, um, Taylor's going to go ahead and talk about special awards yes. while she's up here. All right, so with special awards, so we will have three finalists that will come on stage and they'll do a presentation in front of those preliminary, the final, or in front of the final round judges. But special awards, this is another way for your students to get recognized for their hard work on stage. So it's just another way for them to get excited about the competition because if we do have 35 teams and only three teams can come on stage as a finalist, you know, we don't want the other kids not to get something. So with the special awards, we actually have professional societies that help to sponsor Future City, and they will go around and they will talk to your students. So what will happen is you'll be set up in a gym setting, and you'll have judges who's gonna come around and they're gonna ask you questions based on their criteria. So this is a PowerPoint for our special awards. This was last year's special awards, so these are subject to change, but I just wanted to give you an example. And what we normally tell people is, 
Don't focus on trying to get every one of these awards. Focus on a couple that you feel like your team is very strong in and is very confident about and that they know a lot of information about. So, um, for example, like our team last year who went to the National Future City, they actually took on the special award for Best Project Management Team. So we actually had that award at our regional competition as well. And so one thing with this, it says at the bottom, um, special consideration will be given to teams that list potential unexpected events and situations that they thought that might present challenges for their project and what they did to prevent them. So your kids might have had a challenge as they were building their city. So if they really know about that, that's a good special award for them to try to win. Some of these special awards are not even, you won't have a special award judge team can talk to you. They're gonna be ones that are based on competition score. So like best essay, um, that is one that your students, when they turn in the best essay, whoever does score the highest will win a special award. Uh, when they do win a special award, they will get announced on stage at our, fi at our um, final award ceremony. They do each get a plaque, the educator gets a plaque and the mentor, and then you also all get a gift card as well. So it's just another way and a picture taken. So um, honorable mention, we still want to recognize our fifth and sixth place team. So that would be one that would come from the scores. Most creative use of materials. So there's one um, special award team that goes around and just looks at the cool things that you have in your city. So if your students have something that they really thought was neat that they used, they can talk about this. So there's a bunch of different examples. Best distribution of power. Um, we've got best nuclear technology. So CNTA, they've actually provided an extra guideline, and I believe you have these in your folder. Mm -hmm. um, so they're looking for nuclear technology. They love future city. So they have made a handout to explain what they're looking for and what they're going to talk to your students about. So it's one thing, too, it's just it's a great resource even for your kids to let them know about nuclear technology or nuclear energy. Um, I know sometimes one of the standards is different forms of energy. So you can utilize this to get your kids knowing all that. It will definitely help them. And they really like, they really don't like to come to the day of the competition and nobody has used That's nuclear. <laughs> nuclear. <laughs> right. And they are, yeah. And we and really they, like their money to help run the yeah, competition. Yeah. I know, yeah. And they are a big, they do help to really sponsor Future City. Yeah, so. they are a platinum sponsor. They're yes. one of the highest. So sponsors. they, they <laughs> love it. But they, I know last year they felt like, some of the kids didn't know about it. So they, this is why this year they were like, we're gonna make this, give it to your teachers to use. And it also helps you when you're trying to teach it too. So if you just wanna look through this and what's gonna happen is once I get all of our sponsors, I will make a new slideshow that tells you what the title of the award is and what the criteria is. That way you already have it and you already know what they will be judging you on. So if we add in one of these things, how, do we include that on the flip chart? Do we put a sign on our model that no. says nuclear power today? So, yeah, you could do that, and but what's they're all going to come talk to you. Okay. So every special awards judge team will have to go talk to every team. Okay. Even at our region, at our regional. At, our, at your regional. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So well, they. So if I. When I'm your team's not right. presenting, when like we have like seven teams presenting in the preliminary rooms, uh -huh. all the other thirty teams are in the gym being seen by the special award uh, judges. Yes, and it's like one team will, like special award judge team leaves and you have another one coming up, coming to talk okay. to you. Because they've got to go around and talk to every team. Um, like Ms. Reynolds, I know a lot of yours won special awards last year, so. And it's, and your kids still get excited about that, don't they? They really do. Yes, I mean, I it's saw the deal. smile on their face when they were getting announced, so. And in addition to those, we have what's called our judge awards. Right. So like the day of competition, our judges will come, maybe they see, oh wow, we saw somebody use the best use of macaroni noodles or something like that that yes. we've ever seen. So they gave them best macaroni noodle award. So, so they Aww. are inventing, the, inventing some awards the day of as well. And so your special award judge teams are different than your preliminary judge teams. Your preliminary judge teams are the ones when you go in the competition room who are actually gonna be sitting in front of you like a panel and who will be asking you questions. So they're two completely different sets. So any questions about special awards? And if you if you think of questions, if you don't think of it right now, you can always email me or John and we feel free, we will answer any of your questions about Future City. All right, thank you. I think, do we, oh, uh, yes. Oh, you're talking about 
October 5th by October 15th. So tomorrow, tomorrow will be great. Well, I'll be, we're actually going to be in Spartanburg tomorrow doing a workshop for this. So, um, but Thursday I'll be back in the office and I can actually email you the enrolling to everybody in case you haven't signed up. It didn't, okay. Well, I'll try to resend it. What you and, it and you can also talk about enrolling for future city. Okay, yeah, because I think my principal paid the $25 registration. Oh, it's supposed to be free. And on. see, I don't have, I can't get onto the, I right. can get there. Yeah, and then when you get there, this is where you go to the top and log in. And see, I can't, will you click that? What does it say? So we have, there's see, a, I don't have the password. How do I get it back from my it. principal? Wait, we have it. Oh, you're awesome. And there's a special link that I have that Carolina. should go straight to South Carolina. Okay. So let me see if I can get it. I have my iPad. Let me see if I can get it to work to see if that one's working. So while Panuth is setting up, just real quick on the website, if, if you've not registered, you'll go here to register. After you register, you will have set up a um, username and password. So that's where you go back in to log in, to turn things in, um, to get your SimCity codes. Under resources, yeah, awesome. um, under resources, you can filter down. There are some a bunch of activities that are built into the programs or curriculum activities some background information if you want to get the judge's manual, things particular to SimCity, competition forms, uh, research resources, standards, handbooks, rules, rubrics. So you can filter those things down and then they'll show up under here. Under gallery, um, Taylor was mentioning about the going to the YouTube website to look at the five finalists from last year. Um, I don't know if they fixed this, but don't, there was a problem with the filter the other day but it's listed right here. So if you look at 2019 finals, there's the Alabama team, there's the New Jersey team, there's the Idaho team. Pennsylvania Central was the team that won last year. So all five of these are the five top national winning presentations. And when John was not that rotating model, they did have a rotating model last year that won. So we won't play it all, but just a little bit of it. Oh, it's the piloted action. by clean, sustainable, and resilient energy and waste the access to transport, solar roadways. But it gives, if wa watching them gives you, you can see level. the energy the level that your students need, the QCS confidence level LEDs that they need. QCS and roadway solar tiles to inform the public to safely direct traffic and provide priority access to rescue workers. Expanding storm drains and it's trying to find where they've turned their models. Yeah. But then and you also have the section on where you can listen to the questions so that the judges ask. So we have three asked. moving parts. Our oh. first one would be our next pods. And these are large freight next pods. They can also be used to collect waste and for emergencies. And they rotate on a spinning track. Yeah, we have our water and flooding solutions over here. We run water through the Shiri La Sabu Dam right here. And it's demonstrating how we would divert the access flooding water into the rice paddy fields or the Matsukawa underground storage facility. Our third moving part would be on the back of our model. So yeah, all three students answered the question. And if you want to get a five on the moving part, you do have to come forward on the one. What the rubric says. So the gallery is a great place to go and um, there's just lots of pictures that you can look at. Um, oh, North Carolina one last year. See pictures of models, pictures of teams. Goes all the way back. Has the winning essay, so you can get a good idea of what a winning essay looks like. So lots of great resources on the website. Also, some places about leading your team, about the competition. Um, wanted to show you also under Find My Region. The South Carolina has a South Carolina region has its own page, and once our workshops are done, we will update this resources section here and under the resources section we'll have all of the things like we've shown you today okay. the powerpoints the powerpoint from the person that did the essay ways to find a mentor the special awards criteria the timeline all of that information is under our resources section on our South Carolina page awesome and John <laughs> we found really really helpful because it has activities for um, like zoning and different mm -hmm. things which they will use in their 
their virtual city, go use it on their model, they talk about the zones yeah. in their essays, you know, why you don't put, you know, a lot of, you know, different things in different places. You know, yeah, so if so you filter down by activities and apply that, exactly. you'll get all of these great activities. Yes, well, and a good I've, one already on been, I've already scale. been doing these. It's going on infrastructure too, uh, huh? Yeah, right. those are great. Especially There's for three, me. Three I'm pages of that. Doing Here's that zoning. Class. Yes. You know, and yeah, I especially need, if you're doing it as a class, these are some good, good lessons. And that's stuff you can do with your sixth graders next semester. Right. You know what I mean? Have right. you played with those yeah. any? Oh, yeah. 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 Seventh grade to stay on for a little year. They'll be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About yeah. The yeah. And the competition was and how to get started for them. Those that work in the following. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is Puneet Kumar. Yeah. Okay. And um, he is on our Future City Regional Committee. He is what we call our Sim City expert. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so he's going to kind of talk us through those folks that um, are not familiar with SimCity. If you are familiar with SimCity and you don't need this brush up, we are finished with the other part of the workshop and you're welcome to go. Um, but those are folks that need this information, can give your attention to me. Hello. Um, so I'm going to kind of walk you through this. Um, as far as opening up the game and getting it installed and stuff like that, for the most part. Uh, John has already given you most of the information as far as the rubric and all that. Um, the Future City website is actually really, really, really useful. Um, it tells you, it's got different, different tips on how to take screenshots inside SimCity um, and the basic playing tips and so on and so forth. I have some that I a couple years ago to try and bring it in a little bit more basic than they have even. Um, but and after I'm done with this, if you guys have any questions or anything, just shout them out. So this is Origins, or Origin. Uh, this is the first step of actually getting SimCity onto your computer. Uh, my computer is about eight to 10 years old, so it can play it. <coughs> not great uh, for those of you who have concerns about having older computers and so on. Um, it should be able to play anyway. I have not tried this yet lately. Um, because it does not want to work. Give me one second. So with SimCity, the very basic of it is you need to have a feel for what the kid's wanting to do. This is the entire process with the SimCity virtual city component is you want to have, um, you want to show progress. It's not so much about if you have an amazing city or, or whatnot. It's more about how you define your goal and how you move towards that goal. So whether or not you actually meet your goal is irrelevant to some degree. Uh, the rubric is set up so that if you, even if you don't meet your two goals, if you're working towards that and your analysis and your strategies are sound, you're gonna get most of your points. If you do meet your goals, you're gonna get a five in a couple of categories, but otherwise, even if you don't, you'll probably get a three or four. So it's only a point or two off. So, as you can tell, the computer is rather a little bit. All right. So when you go through Origin, you have to. What you'll end up doing is you put in your SimCity code that you have, um, and it'll ask you to register a username and password. So the way you get it on five different computers, um, well, the way I would do it, and you can probably get it onto more. Um, if you get one username and password and you set it up for the kids, they can actually take that download of origin on however many computers they want, take it offline and log in and 
download SimCity onto that computer. If you take it offline, it won't update the, the game. You won't get, you won't have um, multiple copies of the city floating around. But they can kind of get used to what's going on, how the game plays, and so on. So if you're, if you decide to do that, make sure you have one person or one computer designated as this is the one you're going to play the actual. But the others can be like practice. Yes. They'll be offline. That's right. Okay. That's right. Um, and you don't actually have to have it to ever go online, honestly. Um, if you go online, it'll update the, the game um, with whatever version is on the server. So it'll say that whatever you're playing will save up onto the server, and whoever else goes in and tries to get it. Uh, start the game, and they, if they're online, they'll download it. So, so would you recommend they play online just for backup in case something goes wrong with the download? I actually wouldn't. I would actually play it offline. The reason for that is if, let's say, you've got two different people who are playing the game, and they're both online. First of all, you can only have one computer online at any one time, point in time. Um, so. Uh, let's say I upload the game to the server, um, and this is the one that I'm going to submit to for the competition. If somebody goes on on accident, they could overwrite that game or overwrite whatever file. The good part about this is it's less about the game so much as the PDF file that you're putting together. But if you haven't taken all your screenshots or you're trying to go for one specific point in time, that sort of thing, really kind of mess things up. So I would typically suggest that you stay offline so you don't have that problem. So this is the basic screen. Um, right now it's set up in single player mode. All you have to do is go to play or resume. I'm going to just go ahead and start a new city. So, so I'll create a game. And you can pick any of these sections that you want. It does not matter what you pick. Um, I'm just going to pick that one. And you'll name the, the region. So, what's your city? All right, so you remember one of the requirements is that you don't play in sandbox mode. Sandbox mode is basically the same thing as God mode in the previous versions of this game. Um, so sandbox mode, do make sure that it's not clicked before you go into the next set. And when you come up to this, you see how the region, the different sections are kind of highlighting. Um, whatever region you pick will be where your, your city will start. I'll pick something easy so it's not difficult. This is about the different commodities that you can find in that specific section of this region. Okay. So, so it'll start loading, yeah. And, and if you do read these various things, they are going to be kind of silly in this game. Uh, geared toward kids, so uh, you'll see some stuff. It's not hurting cats. Not this time. I've seen that. that hurting cats? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hurting cats on the back of the dog. Oh. Oops. So as far as the, um, while this is loading, as far as the actual deliverable that you send in. One of the things that you need to remember when you're taking your screenshots is that you want it to be the same time of day and you want it to be the same screenshots. Meaning, it, you know, it can be a few years in the future or whatever you need to get to whatever population you want or whatever your goal wants to be. Um, but you need to make sure that it's the same time frame as far as, you know, daytime or you know, whatnot. Let me show you this. All right. Movement around the square is pretty simple. 
Just let, you don't have to drag or anything, you just move it and it'll move. If you click, if you left click, you can rotate up, down, around. And if you right click, it'll kind of do the airplane thing. First things first. So what you end up starting with is just a road. It's just a little highway. And the first thing you have to end up doing, and it, the game will kind of walk you through it. It'll tell you what it's looking for and what you need to do. So you can see a couple things are highlighted in red. This is, you're currently in the city view. And it's asking you to build a road. So in here, you get different types of road. Um, and depending on which road types you pick, you'll get different types of buildings that will come up in that area. So if you pick a low density dirt road, you're going to have a couple houses here, a couple houses there. If you're really looking for population and so on, you need to go to a higher density street and so on. Now, be aware that the higher density you go, the more city-like you go, the more it's going to cost to actually create that section of road. Well, I'm just going to pick so is that 50000 at the bottom your, your money, basically? Right. This right here is your money. And this will actually, if you click on this, will bring up your budget panel. So from here, you can set your taxes once you get to the point where you can actually get to a town hall. Um, you can do bonds, and it will show all of that. And once you actually have expenses and income, it will show, show all of that. This will end up being one of the screens that you're going to be taking screenshots of. So that if we can, when we're judging your cities, we can see as much as we can of the inner workings of your city and what your goals are. So um, in years past, uh, one, of the thing, one of the goals that was used quite often was always having renewable energy. So you would have, they would, the kids would go through and have, um, they would have dams, they'd have uh, wind and solar and whatnot. Um, so it really just depends on how you're going to set that up. But each of these different panels will kind of give you different data. So that's the budget panel, this is a population panel, and you can get into your, the details of it and so on. And Highly, highly recommend. We see this every single year. Please go download the template from the website. Do not try to make your own presentation template. Every year, some team tries to do that. And their city is great. They know that they're doing a good job. But they'll always miss one part of that template. And they will get docked every single time when you're judging. What, what template are you referring to? So the template is like the uh, the sample city in your folder. You had your packet. One was the template and one was the sample version. Uh, do you have a folder, John? Okay. So this must be the template. Yes. Okay. So they have an electronic version of that template on the website. This one? This one right the here. one with the blue writing on it. Okay. So the virtual city. And then channel. this is an actual one. Okay. Right. So on, on the website, you can find this template. And it'll go through and tell you exactly what you need to insert where, which screenshots, and so on. Well, make sure you follow that. I say that every single year, and every single year, we have a couple of teams that don't do that, and they always miss points. So I highly recommend you. So you download the template from the, the website or from the game <coughs> itself? From Future City website. Future City, future, web, future City website, okay. That's right. South Carolina Region or National website? Is it in the South Carolina Region resources or is it the National? The regular resources. Just the regular, regular resources. resources of the main webpage. If you go to futurecity.org, future city up at the top there's a tab that says resources. When you click on that, it comes up with everything. Um, electronic versions of your of the guide, the, all the paperwork that you have here, except for the stuff that's specific to South Carolina. So the template, uh, as a teacher, mentor, I'm the one who downloads it to my computer and I make a PDF and give it to the student or a thumb drive, and they can use that template because 
they won't be able to download it on the laptop they're using to play the game. Right. So I'll be taking it, so putting it on a thumb drive, therefore they'll have it to access the thumb drive to make the screenshots, put it into the PDF, and I can upload it. That's right. Okay. Yep. Last one. That is exactly right. All right, so we'll, before I continue this, are there any other questions? Okay. So let me just go ahead and place a couple roads. Total amount you'll see over there. It tries to snap you to a perpendicular, usually. So I just, it just snapped me to a perpendicular. I'm just going to go ahead and use it. And it'll show you the grid lines next to it for if you want to have future streets. Right, if you want to put future streets on it. So I'll go ahead and do another one. And just randomly pick another one. I'm going to go this way. So, after you build a road, this right here is your zoning tip tool. You can set up, if you're talking about residential, commercial, or industrial. And depending on how much space you have between your streets, it'll go and build different buildings. Um, so, be aware that if you want like big industrial complexes and so on and so That's forth, you've got to you guys spread those out. Does it kind of go in order down there at the bottom? I mean, or does like so this right here is residential, commercial. Yeah, industrial. I mean, like you did roads first because it was lit up in red. Right. After you do your zone, is it it'll continue to tell me what to do next? Yeah. Okay. And to some, after you get going on this, it'll kind of start to flow. Um, you'll see different things. It'll also have different pop-ups, different, for lack of a better term, quests that you can do. Like in some cases it'll say, build a school, build a police station, build this, build that. And what it'll do is it'll give you money to continue your development. And it's stuff that you're gonna need to have it anyway. So, let me just go ahead and do the residential section. So I'll just pick right here, go over that. And, oops, sorry, down here, we're, we're currently on turtle speed. You can pause, you can speed up, up to a certain degree. What I always suggest you do is when you're making changes, pause the game. And then that way you're not fighting um, so the zones or you're not fighting the system as it's trying to grow. But make small changes and start it up. And pause. Right. So I'll start it up and then I'll go to the faster speed. And you can see they're clearing land and they're starting to build houses. So now down here, this here tells you what the demand is. So I'm going to go ahead and pause it. Right now, they're perfectly happy with oh. their demand. They what they've got is good. Now I've got 30 people that are building houses or at least have joined my city, sorry. But they're really upset because they have no water. So join that, and we'll tell you, all right, well, here's your water. And this screen will show you where the various deeper pockets of water are. This will also show for um, when you're putting down a power plant, or wind generator, uh, turbines and so on, where the wind is, how much wind, what kind of power you can be expected to get. Are you offline right now doing I this? I am. Yep, I'm offline. All of this is straight built into the game. So I'll just go ahead and drop it right there. Oh, it shows you where the water is. Mm -hmm. The darker blue is more water, and the lighter sort of blue depth. is less water. Um, and this kind of shows how. Oh, come on. Are the screenshots per game, or is it per team? I'm sorry. So the, the screenshots you take and submit is that per team? Per team. Okay. Per per uh, team. So not one per member. That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Anything they turn in um, for any other rule will be as it's as you can write. Yeah. Thank you. 
So I've added the water, but once again, I haven't hit play yet, so they're still complaining. Once I get that going, you can see the pipes are showing water flowing to the houses. And let me pause this again. This screen right here will tell you how clean the water is, what kind of pollution level it is, what you've got excess, and what kind of demand you've got. That's going to be important for our topic this year. Right, and that'll kind of show you what you're going to need to show. If you're talking about, if one of the things, if one of your goals is have clean water or whatever, you want to show this. And I think usually there's like a little way to show that. Um, so. Now this is going again for power. There's different types, wind, coal, oil, etc. I'll just go ahead and do wind and throw it in. And it'll show you, as you can see, the arrow is pointing which direction it's going. So with this, you should remember if you're dealing with industry and you've got some smoke generation and whatnot, if your wind is typically that way, you're going to want all the, the industry it's way up at the top yeah. so it stays out of your city. So with the wind generators, it really does not matter. I'm just going to drop it right here. Now the kids aren't going to know all those tricks, so they run this game and then they see it go wrong and they're like, oh, we need to change that? Yeah, okay. you can do that. Um, part of this is also thinking about what does a t city typically need and what considerations, what things because should you Because these consider. are 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. Where are they right. getting that information from? That's going to be partially the mentor, honestly. Which I don't have. Or, yeah. Mentor or teacher, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. So, um, but quite honestly, if they start playing, I think they'll, figure, they'll it figure it out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. okay. So as far as that goes, you've got power running to deal with all that, and it's working for you. Um, one trick to pay attention to, and I'm not going to keep going with the rest of this unless you guys really want me to. No. But so you've got the main portions here, okay? Um, this is your, there is a approval rating screenshot you're gonna have to take, a budget screenshot, and some population screenshot. It tells you all those, thank you. Right, it's, okay. they're, us they're usually down there. If you're not sure where it is, if you can't find it for whatever reason, down here on the bottom right, that's all the data maps in the entire game. That's awesome. Okay. So you can go through and click through and figure which ones are which. So Sim City was put on two computers at my school last year because a teacher was supposed to start working with this. If I can get those two computers in my classroom, my kids can go ahead and start playing with this. Okay. Yeah, you can start and you can start Did multiple you? cities on the same computer. You can, it doesn't have to be the same one. Okay. You can have more about how you do a screenshot because that's in your folder. It is in the folder. Um, a thing that tells you how to do the right. screenshot. Yeah, and it'll it'll tell you exactly where it's going to be and everything. One thing before I forget that you really ought to know and remember. Up here, this is your options up at the top right. Uh -huh. You've got settings right here, okay? The computer will take care of optimizing your graphics and your audio and the game and all that stuff. The one thing that I want to make sure that you know about is under gameplay, this little checkbox right here disables all random disasters. Make sure it's checked. There have been times when a team has started up a city, gotten it going, and then an asteroid came in and obliterated the city. Oh. So it's either that or you know fire or something like that. So that's. So make sure, make absolutely certain that you dis disable random disasters. Um, some tricks with as far as getting out of the game part, but actually the presentation part. Kind of see where it's going. Um, if what your goals are will guide the students as to what they think, where they are, where they want to go, and then what changes do they need to make Two goals. That's right. Two goals and two sets of screenshots. Um, 
And then after they're done with all that, if they want to obliterate their city, they can they can uncheck it and let it go. Yeah, they, there's a way to actually um, go ahead and do the disasters on their on their own. So they can pick what disaster they want to destroy. I could stay here all night and talk with you, but due to the fact that I'm two hours away, I need to go. <laughs> Thank you so much. And sorry we ran over. It's just a lot of information. That was wonderful.